Welcome to Debate Night, powered by Turning Point USA. Tonight, Charlie Kirk will debate Rachel Bittekoffer, political strategist and founder of Strike Pack. Tonight's topic, is banning CRT in schools necessary? Rachel, you have the floor. Yeah, it's really difficult for me to start off talking about CRT because my, most of America, I have no idea what the hell it is. So, you know, I'm happy to talk a little bit about CRT as I think it means, which is probably more blanket about diversity inclusion education rather than the actual critical race theory, um, which is only taught in law schools, as you know, and not something that I am well versed in to discuss as an expert. But I will tell you, uh, in terms of the like, critical race theory stuff um, that you know it, it is being talked about in politics, I think for the average listener. They're hearing something about diversity and inclusion programming at school and certainly think we see that reflected in legislation that's being crafted for CRT because it does not say, hey, in K through 12 education, we're not going to have, um, pro we want to have proper curriculum and we're not going to have this, you know, high level college course like material, right, in our K through 12. The bans as they're being written include things like diversity, it could fall in anyway into diversity and inclusion education. So, um, you know, I'm very excited to be here to talk about that and um, debate out whether or not we should be talking about diversity yes. and inclusion in schools and what, you know, the proper role for government in terms of curriculum is, too, which I think is going to be an issue that's going to be really important to you. Great. So, yeah. You know, you put me in a really tough spot <laughs> because you're a Duck fan. Yeah. Like, not like a passive Duck fan. No. Not like I'm kind of a half, like actually a real Duck fan. So I have to be like really nice to you, yep. and I will anyway. So we can disagree <laughs> on that, no matter what. Go ducks, everybody. So yeah, look, I, I think I think that what we're gonna we're gonna figure out what we both mean. So I'm gonna try not to talk past each yeah. other, but I mean, look, CRT as it's written, as it was literally in like the intro to critical race theory in 1991 by Delgado, was basically saying what we would call today is very racist, and it is being taught in elementary schools and grade schools. The essence of it, right? It might not be taught as like the complex esoteric legal theory, but also it's coming into policy as well. It's coming into policy of actually how we educate kids from segregated classrooms in Atlanta to black only dormitories at Western Washington University. So it's more than just kind of a issue in curriculum. It's actually changing the way education itself is done which I think is something that we need to explore. And I think it's also super evil to say that white kids should go to one classroom and black kids should go to one classroom. I thought we kind of ended that chapter in our country, maybe not, um, through the Civil Rights Act, amongst many other things. So look, CRT, as it was written, as far as intro to, so intro to critical race theory back in 1990s, um, literally I could read the words for you, but it's somewhat just reiterating that it's racist, pure and simple. They want to change the way that we structure conversations on race. They want to view people through a racial lens. And I grew up in an America where I went to a very diverse high school where that was de-emphasized. And I believe race should be de-emphasized, especially in the education of our children. And even beyond that, segregating kids in school, I think, is plain evil. Great. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it would surprise most people to find out that today's education, the K through 12 system, is actually more racially segregated than it was at the height of segregation. And, and that's all by choice and, mo and mobility, um, you know, people moving out of the cities and into the suburbs and so on and so forth. And it's certainly not reflective to all school districts, but in places like Alabama, it is, you know, absolutely the case where we are, we are producing naturally through the free market, if you want to put it on that, uh, a segregated world, right? So then you have to think about, well, why? Why are people still naturally, behaviorally keen to segregate, right? And it, 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 it's easy, I think, for two white people, myself and you both grew up in pretty similar circumstance, I'm sure, a middle-ish class life in, in the Navy, um, and lots of diversity. I also thought we were living in like a post-race world, right? If we can't talk about race, how are we going to foster an environment where people feel comfortable being with people that they don't uh, feel are in their, in their racial tribes, right? So like if, we, if we decide that any conversation about race is by inherently raci racial or racist, as your terminology goes, it makes it very difficult, I think, for people who are interested in coalition building, community building, dealing with like what we would call de, de facto segregation, so not 
by law, but by behavior. Um, and it, I guess I would be interested to hear if we don't want to talk about diversity, how do we how do we achieve those goals? Since you seem very keen to be, um, you know, living in a post-racial Rachel, your time world. is up. Yeah, I mean, Sorry, I you have one minute. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I was raised in that country. I went to a high school that was 53% Hispanic. Mm -hmm. I was a minority as a white Christian male. And no one talked about race. and was great. We talked about character. So like, I don't need to be like lecturing in some sort of hypo hypothetical world. I was raised in that world. And it was awesome. Everyone got along. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, went, you, you were in the Navy, or you grew up around the Navy, that's right. And so maybe you have your own different experience with that. But the more we talk about race, the more we actually bring those demons of our past to the forefront. Like we're actually producing racism, we're manufacturing it. We're, we're, there's a supply and demand problem with racism in our country where there's an incredible demand to try to find it and we're trying to increase the supply of it. And when you have playgrounds in Denver where you say white families are not allowed to come, black families only, how is that not just reinstituting the same segregational policies that we said were evil in the 1930s and 40s, which they are, and then just flipping it on its side to say actually now we're going to be racist to white people, which is actually the creed of Ibram X. Kendi. He says segregation today to fix segregation of yesterday. I mean, I won't do the typical liberal thing, which would be to point out, you know, the statistics about <laughs> home ownership and historic racism and, and uh, you know, why you might need affirmative action to achieve diversity, because I think that will just take us down a rabbit hole. And I really want more, I think, to talk about the substance of, you know, America. So it is true that when we were children, and I'm 10 years about older than you, um, you know, we did not have curriculum that dealt with diversity and inclusion at all. And like the American for Disabilities Act was in its infancy. So like programs for students like my son with autism were few and far between in K through 12. So we're really talking about a school environment now that has been spending, oh, I don't know, 20 years kind of building up an infrastructure that's more focused on, um, you know, community building exercises, getting people to be accepting and tolerant of others, reducing school bullying and, um, you know, suicide and issues with kids. And I just don't know how we can have a conversation without mentioning race when we're talking about, you know, an inclusive environment. Like, do you think there's something, I'm just going to ask a question, mm -hmm. do you think there's something morally wrong with black-only graduation ceremonies? So I would argue that there is definitely something wrong with anything that is exclusive, unless we're talking about a situation where, have you, so you, you talk about being a minority in your high school, right? Well, certainly and, not a minority in the country, yeah. but yes, in the high and school. And I also went to a very diverse high school. Yes. It was at least 50% African-American, right? Um, and, you know, the thing that I noticed about it, what, for me, it was a real shock the first day I enrolled because I came from a smaller city first and moved into that to see, like, oh, this is the first environment I've ever sat in where I, where not everyone's white, right? I mean, at least half the people are around me were black. And, you know, what I would have liked back then is some direction on, how, on getting to know people from a different world, right? Like, our problem is siloing too much, right? Um, with all the technology we have, we're only hanging out with people that agree with us, come from our own walk of life. Um, for example, when you mix people together, you get things that you could not have in a homogenous right. environment like with one representative of that minority group. So I just, you know, I think it's important to keep in context that too, like the America that I grew up in the 80s and the 90s for you is much more diverse, right? So we, um, I don't see the, the need for diversity and in, in inclusion education for perpetuity, right? But isn't, a, right? isn't like, for example, a black only graduation ceremony, isn't the opposite of diversity? So where was a black only Columbia celebration? Columbia University. Okay, and why was it black only? Good question. No, I mean, literally, like, what was the rule that made it black Because only? they said they're uncomfortable around white people. Oh, really? <laughs> so it was a private ceremony. Yes, yeah. and white people were not allowed. I, you know what? I, I am, I'm going to be very um, uh, steady across things. And when I was teaching in Georgia, I had found out that there was a high school in Georgia still doing a whites-only prom. I think that's evil. In 2012, dude. It was like 2013. I think that's evil. You can Google it. And, and you agree that? Like, yeah, right. yeah, no, okay. and definitely, and the way that they were doing that, by the way, is going into private education, which is a really important conversation right. I think we should so, have, because when you're in the private sector, you can do things like black only or white only, and I definitely well, agree that we want to Not anymore, Civil Rights Act that. disallows that, but we could talk about that in a sec. So, you live in Oregon? I do. Yeah, there's a black only school that's been chartered. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? I have not looked at that, so I'm not going to comment on that at all. Right. But, you know, it, to me, imagine... Suburbs of Portland, yeah. So here's, here's one thing that really sticks with me. Have you ever read the book Cast 
by Isabella Wilkerson. No. Okay. I read that book. Um, it was a hard read. And history is a hard read. If we, it, you know, take a hard look I at agree. all history, not just the U.S. history, right? Yeah. Um, I've been studying world civilization pretty intensely over the last year. And there's commonalities in human behavior that are not unique to America. I agree. Right? So to me... Like Our story's exceptional, but yeah, for sure. It, it is. It's, it's an exceptional yeah. story, but it's... but. There are things that are commonalities between us and other people in other countries, yeah, right? I totally agree. And um, one thing that humans unfortunately have a default setting to is violence and intolerance. This conversation has been very informative so far. Let's keep the good dialogue going. Rachel, let's pick up with you. Um, yeah, no, so, 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 all right. It's difficult to imagine what it would be like to be in a place where you stood out. A lot, right? I mean, you know, you and you're a handsome guy, so you Thank stand you. out that you way. You know, most of my detractors would completely disagree. <laughs> oh, you got the hair. You're I the mean, first Jesus. liberal to ever that call me handsome. That hair is just, you know, to die for. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you quote that, everybody. <laughs> Charlie Kirk has hair to die for. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, but other than that, I'm don't take this now. I'm going to let you down. Oh, here you're we go. You're pretty nondescript, right? And so am I. And you know, I don't know that we can understand what it would be like to be not nondescript in the sea of, of people who all have this commonality and you do not, right? So I think, uh, you know, when we think about what diversity and inclusion education, which is to me more useful to talk about than a, than a, like no, a legal no, theory. No, that's fine, but like I'm using examples of how we're actually organizing education, Yeah. right? right. So like at Western Washington University, they have black only dorms. That's the opposite of diversity. Yeah, but I mean, imagine if you, if, if you were the, uh, let's say you're 10% of a university. Like CNU had fantastic racial diversity, it's still like 20%, right? So like if I went to an HBCU, which I wouldn't, like I don't know if I would get in or not, but like I guess they can't discriminate in race, and I had a white only dorm, that would be bad. Yes, because you're at a black college. <laughs> it would be weird, right? Yeah, so do you get what I'm saying? No, it's like this is no longer like theory. We're like yeah, organizing. Yeah, but I mean, think about it the other way. Like, education. not every black student can afford a private tuition at HBCU. Those are extraordinarily no, 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 expensive, but, so, but right? Western and Washington. usually competitive for admissions. So, like, if you go to a normal university, and the University of Georgia is a great example of this because we both hate their football program because totally it has our natty. Yeah. Our natty. We okay? stole their football coach. No shit. We did. We did get revenge, didn't we, Charlie? Give me that. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, damn Lenny. All right. Um, anyway, uh, you distracted me. But at University of Georgia, where uh, the, the, the population of that state is 30%, okay? 30%. Black, yes. Black. The university student body, when I was there for that four or five years, was only 10% black. Right. right? So, so you imagine then, if like, I'm trying to guess, I guess I'm trying to, to explain, like, what would it be like if we took Charlie Kirk and dropped him in, a, in an African country where he was the minority student? He would probably feel lonely and want to have programs that help well, him. Well, look, I mean, I hate to, like, say that I've, I haven't lived anything close to that, but I did grow up in a high school where I wasn't the majority. Right. And I didn't feel, like, inclined to go start a white-only group. Would you, do you think you would have, though, if it was 90-10? No, I, see, this is important. Whether I would have or not is irrelevant, whether it's right or not. See, like, if you're in the minority... Well, people do things that are wrong all the I time. I agree, so it's wrong. So the <laughs> right. fact they're doing it doesn't mean it's right. So, like, rebuilding the tribe is bad. Not that if you want to do it. Like, of course, in your natural instinct, you want to be in your tribe. Right. But, like, what makes the West different is we tried to break the tribes apart. We, yeah, I mean, there's a natural melting pot of that At least an attempt identity. to try to get right. there, right? Yes, so very much. So what, yeah. what CRT is, or whatever you want to call it, and I think we're agreeing on some of this, is, like in Atlanta and in Portland, all these places where they start to put people back in their tribe, it doesn't matter if people would want that, it's wrong. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think too, like we really need to, to think about, like, okay, if we have this natural segregation still in society and it's causing so much political animus, right? This, um, I don't know if you've ever heard the book by Robert Putman called Bowling Alone. Yeah, I've heard about okay. it. Yeah, how and, and bowling it leagues used to be a very it. big deal. Yeah, yeah sure. but it's mostly it's about you and me, right? We would never maybe get along, except for, turns out we're both like diehard season ticket holding yes, duck fans. that's exactly dude. right. Right, and like that's all that matters, right? Like, so now you and I go to a game, I mean, I'm not saying we're gonna do this America, but you and I are at a game and we're shooting the shit, and you realize, oh man, you know what? Not all liberals are okay? This woman, and she all likes to blow shit up. Yeah, and no, not all conservatives are fascist, right? She um, said it. 
she likes to blow, you know, blow up fireworks. She likes to drink beer. She can talk with me on football. And it breaks the caricatures that we tend to draw about people we don't know. And so, you know, I agree with you. I don't think we disagree that, you know, moving backwards into safe spaces, to use your Yeah, word, or like tribal is spaces. ideal because what we really need in America more than any else is more time together right we need more right. people so doing more I, things i think together. we just ended the debate yeah like, well, that's right let's go watch some football crt is doing the opposite <laughs> it just is like you read their literature Ibram x kendi who's like the archbishop of this stuff he's like we need more segregation like he's supporting this stuff and i agree like we should be trying to find things we have in common not like okay you go to your corner and you go to your corner that only makes the divisions yeah, further. It does. And in, like, in, in a time like this where we're dealing with pressures, international pressures that the world has not faced since the 30s, right? We really want to be, I think, getting our domestic house in order. And I think that's something that you know, I and others have been arguing for a long time. But now we're really starting to see you know, division in America politically, domestic politics, especially about stupid is really going to endanger our international efforts yeah. here dealing with, uh, you know, a military aggressive So I'm going to go a, a step further. Like, the way I framed it, and you agreed with most of it, do you now understand why most parents are really scared and, like, apprehensive of this being implemented, right? Because they don't want that vision. They don't want 1950s America, where it was segregated. Yes, but so here's the thing is, you know, we're, no between the two I'm of not, us, right? I'm like, I, I don't want segregation. CRT is a topic of, of debate, but it is also a political tool, right? And it is a very handy political tool because for the average Virginia suburban person, like when they hear CRT and they see conversations, you know, about books that, that um, you know, have racy stuff in it, like that stuff taps right into emotion, right? Fear, threat, and emotion. So, it, you know, to me, whether or not the merits of CRT, a theory like that in the right setting, certainly not in K through 12, but diversity and inclusion education in K through 12, to me, those things, um, you know, it, it, you have to take into account that, you know, the difference of, of how of, of, of average person's going to hear that, right? They're not going to realize, oh, what Charlie Kirk means is, you know, this, this theory that, you know, the whole system is, is designed in a supremacist way and that, you know, the uh, white power structure has, you know, rigged the rules, da, 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 da. That's not what a parent hears. What a parent hears is, you know, they're making my kid feel bad about being white. Well, yeah, let's right? just start with, okay, yeah. that's fair. What's wrong with a parent being upset about that? Like, should a kid feel bad of something he didn't do? Well, I mean, it, it all's fair in love and politics, right? And especially here in American politics, where we don't have any regulation on on campaign speech, on campaign material, and stuff like that. So, um, so to my we answer have some would be regulation. That's not totally true, but well, yeah, very okay. little, very little, right? And so, like, what my answer would be to that is, it's a, it's 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 a, a handy, expedient political weapon, and because of that, Democrats should behoove themselves to answering it with a counter offense. <laughs> okay, right? so I'm, I'm actually really curious to what you think the counter offense is, but yeah. like, let's just kind of forget the political charge of it. If a kid comes home and is being taught he's terrible because he's white or that's, that's how he feel, it, it, isn't there something wrong with that? Shouldn't that be fixed? Like, no, no eight-year-old should have to feel guilt because of something he didn't do. Yeah, it's just, but like, where are the eight-year-olds that are coming home like that? I have not met one. Like, I, well, I, the whole I'm Virginia pretty, election kind of showed that there's plenty, right? Well, no, I mean, the, the perception, perception is different than actuality, right? So, like, my goal, Charlie, is to create a perception this election cycle that's pretty similar to things about, like, CRT or what have you. Um, and, you know, it, what CRT is advantaged for is it hits at this base pressure that's that's really hitting the electorate right now because we're in this America that didn't exist 40 years ago. It didn't exist in terms of racial diversity. It didn't exist in terms of gender and racial, like du jour uh, equality, right? So we're really looking at a society that's been extremely pressured and, and that's why you see this international too. Um, in other Western democracies, the heterogeneity of the modern uh, populations, populations moving, globalization has really put a lot of pressure on, um, you know, uh, 
uh, the, the hegemonic power structure, which of course is still white people in America. I mean, we still control yeah, so I, most I, of the I, things. I gotta ask so. you, why the heck does that matter? What does race have to do with anything? Why does that matter to you? So I think like the, the answer to that, and you know, being a woman, I can't a answer what it's like to be a racial minority. I can answer to what it's be to like to be a woman, right? And you know, it, it, and we know this now from psychological research that even people who want to be race blind, who feel and passionately feel um, about equality and stuff, when we test them in a lab, have racially, um, re like they respond to race codes, right? So like, you know, in, in laboratory settings, even liberals will respond differently to a black face than a white face, right? And because we are have- Are you talking about unconscious bias? Yes, training? unconscious bias. All been debunked, bias. none of it's true. No, no, I mean, it, it's definitely Zero percent. No. Completely. No. Dr. Fryer, go read his stuff from Harvard. Okay, but here's it's a the thing. Pile of garbage. And this goes back to your piece in the very first piece you ever wrote that made you Charlie Kirk. Okay, right? so the economics textbook. Yes, one? yes. Wow, you know my bibliography. <laughs> I told Impressive. you I've watched you grow up, and I don't mean that in a condescending no, way. No, I just yeah. mean my academic career has tracked okay. with your career, and we're both Trump babies, right? I mean, Trump You're made a Trump you, fan? and Trump made me. It's just in different ways, right? Okay. <laughs> so, so you're a big Trump fan. But yeah. so with with your article on economics, which you know, Paul Krugman aside, he's not a terrific economic uh, economist. Econ no, he's actually right? awful. Yeah, yeah, I mean, actually, he's pretty run of the mill, right? Which is tends. I mean, sometimes we see that in media, not the best academics are doing academic research, trust mm -hmm. me, I'm not the best academic and that's why you see me in the media, right? Um, so anyway, with Krugman, when I, I, I wanted to see where your original like spark was on the education issue and I saw that it tied back to textbook language so I went into look because yes. we're gonna talk about CRTs and textbooks and what the textbooks will look like yeah, for America, ten years ago. Yeah. right? So I um, did, so, so what I wanna stress with you is this, like the way that textbook is written is actually standard and we can debate whether they should have citations, right? But like in the research world, and it doesn't matter if it's molecular biology or politics, there is an academic consensus about something, right? And when there is, like it's pretty standard for them to say, most economists agree or the prevailing you know, um, wisdom is this. Uh, when you are coming from something that is like shattering a paradigm, usually other people will get into that. So eventually there's momentum for yeah. something to say, like this was but, wrong. But they have been wrong and they can be wrong. Yeah, but, but right. like you can always, I mean, look at climate change, right? 10 years ago, there was a big effort to make, you know, to, to promote anti, like, a, like um, scientific research that did not agree with the consensus, right? And on the political right, especially. And they got a what, lot what of- What scientific consensus? Uh, on climate change. Yeah, but which, which part of it? That climate change is man-made and occurring. But to what extent? Um, I don't think that was the debate back well, then. then. The debate yeah, was- Yeah, anyone could say it's man, that's the whole point though, right? The, the, is it 1%, 5%, 10%, 15, 20? If you can't prove it, then you're, you're a novelist. Not at all, not at all. So, what do you do? You're like, okay, man, man contributes to carbon emissions. Oh, and, really? And 95% of science, the scientific consensus says so, that, so let right? Me ask, you let can me, always find right, a detractor. A and when a detractor is Galileo. Or Copernicus. Or Copernicus, but they, when it's They Galileo, change history. When it's Galileo, though, what you will see eventually is a bandwagon effect. And if there was meat to the anti-climate research, that's such then a it would be you know there that's a flawed argument. No, not at all. Okay, let, so let, let's, use it, let's use another example. So basically you're saying if a majority of scientists agree with something, then it has momentum, it must be right. No, not at all. I'm saying if it's wrong, someone will discover that's wrong, and through replication and verification, that fix will eventually become the prevailing wisdom. I mean, I can think of so many examples why right. that's not So like right. if you were reading a textbook in the in so, a different time well, period, let, you let, would have had a different, there would have been a different conversation about supply side economics because in the 80s, that was a new policy. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm right? not that interested in supply side yeah. economics right now, actually. Let's keep the conversation moving. Okay, so <laughs> I want to go back to something though. Why does race matter? I think race doesn't matter to white people because we are in a majority white system and eventually we might notice how it feels to be not um, racially dominant when the world is no longer you know majority white or at least our world isn't and right now it's 66 percent still so besides melanin content do you think there's differences between races um nope do you no then why do we talk about it all the time <laughs> i don't know 
know. Yeah, but you're talking about it. You're like, yeah, we need to talk. It's so, no. It should be irrelevant, so, right? No, no, no. Well, unless you think there's differences I'm, in races, I'm here which to is. I'm going to talk about it with you, but, you know, what I would say to people is the, the topic, of the, the, the conversation around race is not designed to have a substantive impact on race relations. It's designed to win a political argument, right? So, it, you know, in but terms. What do you mean by race relations? I'm confused. Like, how is America racist? Uh, are, all right. Are you familiar at all with the concept of structural racism? Yeah, it's a myth. No, it's so not. It's, so tell me why it's true. Okay. So not outcomes. Tell me why it's true. So the textbook that you hearken back to in the 1950s, right? I found one of those in Virginia. It was I in saw the publication tweet. Yeah, I, from I saw five. It. Yep. And so when we think about like how do you design curriculum that's historically accurate that doesn't talk about oppression? That doesn't talk about one group being oppressed over the other, right? And so when you look at that Virginia textbook, I certainly don't argue that that's what we're looking at heading back towards. But my guess is if you were to try to write a curriculum that covers, you know, slavery in the U.S. or the, you know, uh, Holocaust or whatever and not, you know, give the narrative that this group did this horrible thing to the other group, you're going to have to rely on some pretty... But it wasn't groups, though. That's incorrect. Not every white person was a slave owner. Yeah, well, that doesn't matter, though, because... you know, it... Nine out of 13 states abolished slavery and by the time of constitutional ratification. And here's the other thing. I mean, it's not were... like every white person was supportive. In fact, we had abolitionists at the time of the founding. Exactly. exactly. So, so why would you say one group? Well, I mean, you know, it's not, you don't have to have every white person. No, in fact, the majority right? of white people found slavery to be reprehensible at the founding. I don't know that if we would have polled segregation no, no, we did, actually, in the 50s, we would have well, found that. Let's start with slavery. Nine out of 13 states abolished slavery by the time of constitutional ratification. Yeah, then why did the South secede? Well, they seceded post-cotton gin for economic reasons. We went to war over it, though. To say that America... Now, you guys, the South declared war... Because they expected Lincoln to ban slavery. And he ended up doing it. Well, not for a long time. You know why? Because he wanted, to, he wanted the fight to be about national unity, which is a good way to, I think, come wrapping around, right? National unity. So like, the first few years of the Civil War, he did not uh, expressly say, this war is about ending slavery. He got to it. And he later the got Cooper to Union that address, because the it. South was more passionate and the North needed um, no, no, passion, I know, but right? let's, let's go. I mean, but you said something I want to focus on, though. One group so doing something to the other. Like, that's just not true, right? It's, it would be a small group of white people that exploited incorrectly a I group think, of black like, people. I think the crowds that would show up for the lynchings, according to research that I've read, numbered in like 5,000. And they would mail. They but then would why, take was, pieces, why was slave being ab take slavery being abolished? pieces then? of, of like, these people's bodies no, I'm and not, I'm not supporting that. That's, them, that, right? that, that's a, that's a pathos like, that argument. But, like, that's not a small group of people. That's not an isolated is. event. Well, that's I mean, in certain states it was widespread. A massive systemic problem, right? Nine states abolished it. Thomas Jefferson wrote in the original draft of the Declaration to King George admonishing him for bringing slavery. The first ever anti-slavery convention was in Philadelphia, chaired by Benjamin Franklin in 1775. Thomas Jefferson got rid of the importation of new slaves I in 1807. Guess what? Yep. None of that stuff's taught in our schools right now. Yeah, sure because of CRT. No, it's have not. You, have have you on. ever taught any, ki any kids Hold like on. history, I want though? you to go into they don't a public any school any in thing. Eugene and Portland and ask them, was Thomas Jefferson a racist or did he ban slaves coming into the United States? What would they say? Charlie, I'm going to tell you this. Every semester say? I would ask my students, like, basic. Okay, but I'm asking, like, which... They don't, they don't know any of that but because like, they don't even... They're not, like, they're on their phones Oh, okay, yeah, but, like, whatever, let's talk about Thomas Jefferson. And they don't even know the big main points of World War II do, or American history. Do you think history. that most schools are teaching Thomas Jefferson to be a good person I or think a bad so, person? Good person, yes, definitely. Why are they taking down statues well, yeah, of him, then? Well, you know what? If you go into the deepest county in Alabama where there's deep red Republicans, do you find them doing shit you don't agree with? Well, give me an example. I've given you plenty. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I mean, right now things are getting a little uh, cloudy because some of the things that come out of those deep red pockets are becoming mainstream in Republican politics, right? I mean, CRT bans, right? So Which this we idea do. Yes. of laws. I mean, to me, somebody who is offended by big government should be deeply offended by the idea of the government dictating curriculum. Well, no, no, the government should be small and strong. Do what, it, do what it should do and do it correctly and quickly. So defend but, CRT. These, there's 14 bills. They're being passed. Yeah, so let's states. talk about the Texas like, CRT it's not law. small. In the CRT law in Texas, it says, quote, we want to fulfill the legacy of Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, and I have a dream speech. They want to protect the Federal Civil Rights Act. 
They want to protect the United States Supreme Court decision in Brown versus the board. Right. They want to talk about the emancipation, talk about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and educate on the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Why is that wrong? It's not wrong, but I believe that they are also striking out some other things. Let me right? tell you how they word it. Right, here's <laughs> yeah. how they word it, though. They say that no person, any individual, should feel discomfort, guilt, or anguish, or any form of psychological distress on account of his or her race or sex. We agree with that. Okay, but That's would the you... Bill teach the Holocaust to German students or not? Because well, they're going to definitely feel But I wouldn't blame them for it. Well, it's, nobody blames, nobody's saying that's, you caused that. that that's like, where you you're can, wrong. Yeah, but so, so Charlie, I can also find, and I didn't know I could have a ledger book or a cheat sheet, so you, I would have You could do whatever one. you want. My memory is <laughs> just not as good as yours. My memory is horrible, actually. But, but here's, here's the thing. I can, you can always find exceptions to, to things, no, this outliers. Is, this is evidence, right? not exceptions. You have exceptions. You know, some wingnut people in San Fran, they live in a bubble, right? They think everybody thinks like them, and they pass stupid Okay, how about right? Springfield, Missouri? Like renaming the school Lincoln. Springfield, Missouri. Teachers were told to but rank themselves. That is not a modal oh, no, let me give you four policy examples. But at no, but all. But this is right? all across the country. This is a sampling, No, okay? it's not all across Springfield, the country. Springfield, Missouri. Okay, told they said teachers have to rank themselves on an oppression matrix scale. White English speaking Christian males were taught that they were part of a oppressor class and must atone for their racial discretion. <laughs> I won't even do the San Francisco one because I'll take your critique. How about Philadelphia? Fifth graders were told they had to celebrate black communism and simulate a black power rally to free Angela Davis. And Are, Charlie, that's why like the misinfo on COVID. But this so, is not misinformation. No, listen, it's so it's so it's so dangerous to, to a good conversation. What, what misinfo did I say? Because I don't know if I can believe your bullet points. Let's keep the conversation moving. Let's go back to our education conversation and to kind of close it up. Um, I suppose the last question is, should it be banned? Of course it should. But let me ask you just kind of more general question. CRT should be banned, that is. Um, what, should a, what should a proper education look like? For a child. I guess that's a good way to yeah, close, right? Yeah, that's a good way to close, right? Because I don't think that we would disagree in this regard. And, and like the, the, to me, like the debate we should be having about American education right now has nothing to do with diversity curriculum. It's about civics, right? So we have a political culture. I agree. That is completely anemic, right? And we don't teach people, we teach people about the greatness of being an American. All the benefits get through pretty well. Um, the rights afforded to us. But responsibility for democratic maintenance is not a lesson that we impart in, in any part of our political culture, right? And, um, you know, to me, our, our, our future education really needs to focus on creating a citizen American, um, you know, and not allowing... 50% of the population to sit out the most consequential elections too that are going to determine things for them for the rest of their lives. Yeah, so I mean I find very little I disagree with that. Anything in specific that I mean that I would find yeah, disagreeable I think you would. because that was kind of general. I, think you I would. mean I, yeah, so not like, to when I would teach it, my classes, and by the way, I had um, a student for Trump president in one of my classes. It was terrific. really great. Yeah, and we actually got along really well because you never heard about me, did you? So we got no, along just fine. I actually think you're a liberal, <laughs> not a leftist. I yeah, do. no, I'm it's definitely not a leftist, dude. That's that's a big difference. <laughs> I you wouldn't be a, here if you were a leftist. I drive a pickup truck. Do you really? And watch football. So I'm definitely not a good leftist, right? I love that. <laughs> But um, in any case, like what I was going to say is, I, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, like we really want, and, and this is why I agreed to do the show with you, I, I think it's so important for us to start to talk and spend time with other people who we disagree with and have conversations about things like education, right? Yes. And, you know, the vision that most people have for education is a school that's, that's clean and nice and modernized, right? We don't want to be sending our kids to schools where there's no heat and the student you know people have a air sure. window air conditioners and we also want our student our, our kids to be well rounded right we want them to get um you know what we would small l liberal arts curriculum that involves history science math and i don't know that uh, affording the government permission to decide what and what not affords uh, or is, it qualifies as proper history uh, I just think that that is Well, I mean, I think, though, that if dangerous. all of a sudden, to use an example used earlier, if, like, all of a sudden a group of teachers are like, we're not going to teach the Holocaust anymore, we're going to deny it. 
yeah. think you, you would want to intervene, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, that there's teachers right now who are worried about talking about things like the Holocaust, or like my lecture, I used to do a, a lecture on civil liberties because I teach an American government textbook, and you get a chapter, civil rights, civil liberties, and I had civil rights and civil liberties, and that lecture is very, um, you know, focused on Martin Luther King Jr., the movement to end segregation, which of course happens by judicial and yeah, federal But now we're going to have to right? re-end segregation because of what's being taught in the school. So like, you how, would I'm saying? You teach like seg how would you teach Southern segregation? Truthfully and honestly, you know how, here, okay. here's how. how? Origi Tell me how. No, original source how. documents. Okay. Original source documents right. is the only way to teach history. And when they show that in the South, you know, they designed an institutional structure you want, want me to, tell you? to keep black people from yes. voting, that is naturally going to make white people feel bad, don't you think? No, because they'll feel good because Dwight D. Eisenhower intervened as a Republican president. <laughs> they'll feel good about their country that they, was able to close that chapter. Who Nothing racial doesn't about love it. Dwight Eisenhower, right? I mean, I'm, some people don't like Dwight Eisenhower. The point is that, like, I'd treat honest history, teach honest history. I would read the oral arguments from Brown versus the board. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. They don't do any of that right now. Oh, you understand no, that, right? I agree. I, agree. I would read. I would like read. The education that no, 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 but like this is part of the problem, though, right? Is very bad. And like. Yeah. The yeah, but it's not bad in substance. It's bad in in, in resource and investment. Sure, and I, I, but I'm, ta I'm talking like, more. I know this for a fact because I taught at a competitive university. It wasn't Harvard, okay? But you couldn't just UGA. move in. Both of them, and UGA is actually now because of the universal um, college, free college uh -huh. education for everyone, has is it's each class has gotten better and better. It's like 4.0s, right? So I've taught decent students at two institutions and two institutions in the South, right? And I will tell you, when they come in to me, these kids who are all AP students, they're all like top notch, you know, high school students, or at least B and above, they know nothing about American history. So, no, but like, so you we ask, are obviously not. You would ask how I would teach it, right? So, this is why I'm a big critic of the 1619 Project, because it doesn't use original source documents. It uses it, a lot of them, no, but it does, it does it, also rely on some other uh, second source. I know okay, that. thank you for admitting yeah. that, because not everyone will. No, and, well, and Nicole Hannah Jones does a lot of kind of mishmashing together, and she's been heavily criticized by her peers. But it's also a matter of like, you look at history. Is it telling you a story? What is that story? You want to tell an honest story, right? Right. And what is the type of citizen you want to create? And, you know, you look at the goals of Marcuse and Foucault and Delgado and Ibram X. Kendi and all these, Robin D'Angelo, they are willing to use history as a way to create activists, right? It's like we want to try to make people so angry, so guilty about their past when it's a lot more complex than that. You know it's complex. It's not, quote unquote, black and white. It well, isn't. Yeah, well, it's also impossible to assess history and the actions of people in historical times without acknowledging that you cannot perceive what it would be like to live in that environment, right? Well, I agree yeah. with that. No. That's not the way the educational, re I'm not saying you're defending it, but a lot of the educational regime right now says, like, we know exactly Thomas Jefferson's a bad person, Washington's a bad person. Like we need the founders are racist. That's a consensus view. See, I just I have to vehemently disagree that that's quantitatively true. So like, let, we could find out though, right? We could audit every textbook. Well, like because, if you go to the AP textbook, yes, I want you to do this okay, and come back I will. and ask me, do you think that the AP U.S. History textbook, as it's you know published from Pearson, right, right, do you think it gives the a fair hearing to Madison J. Hamilton? and John Quincy Adams, Adams, Washington. I would say absolutely not. Based on the excerpts I've seen, it's a heavy emphasis on the slave trade, which should, of course, be incorporated, but you know there was a brilliance to the founders. I mean, they, they had a civilization. Oh, absolutely, and I, taught, I I get to teach that. I got to teach that anyway until recently. And, and, so we, you know, we agree on that. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Like, what we need is more, more histor history education. I have just like filled in the gaps for my, oh, and went to college too, right? I mean, a graduate school, and I still knew almost nothing about how World War II came about, how, I mean, I understood the high points, of, you know, World War I and World War II, and I understood the Holocaust, but I did not understand in intricate detail the, the story, the collective story of humanity. And that collective story, Charlie, is one of great promise and amazing achievement, but also a lot of senseless brutality. So, so let me ask you. So my I'm, I'm argument so, is when you, when you talk that. about Madison, he designed the entire Bill of Rights. He was pushed well, to George do it. Well, George Mason did, but yes, that's okay. Yeah. No, no, Madison wrote the Bill of no, Rights. No, he did not. George yes, Mason he did. did. I'm pretty sure he George did. George Mason wrote it in 1776, Virginia Declaration the Bill of Rights. Of, no, yeah, the but Federal George, Bill of Rights.
rights. I'm talking about the Bill of right, Rights and the Constitution. <laughs> James Madison took it well, from George Mason. Well, that's fine. That's okay. That's a separate and, issue. And I believe that Mason yeah. pushed him to but do Madison that. Madison was right? the father of the U.S. Constitution. And, right. and, he, and here's where Madison was really wrong, right? Because he, Madison when, or Mason? Madison. Okay. Because when he was pushed about including specific liberty in protections for individuals, yes. right? When he was pushed about that, he was like, oh, we don't need that. The separation of powers achieves this, this check on tyranny just fine. It secures li li uh, individual liberty. We, we don't, this, all this is just extra, right? And he could not have been more wrong. When we go through the annals of American political development, it is the Bill of Rights getting applied to the states to protect you as an individual over time, over selective incorporation, which is like 200 and some odd years, that actually has produced for today the America that you and I are sitting in is the most free America with the most robust speech that has ever had. Even though we don't think about it like that, this yeah. is this is this is the truth, right? Well, I, I think I think there's some there's some truth to that. I just I think as we close, you know, we both want good education. I think we could agree on it more than not. But the, the closing point I really want to emphasize with you, and I, I'm not sure I'm going to convince you right now, but I am kind of widespread in the educational space, is that the type of history that you want and that I want generally, which is a fair reading of history, which does give the credit to the founders where it's due, which right. is this historical brilliance and genius exactly. that we do benefit from. And then criticizes them robustly for being involved in those that were. Those that were. Enslaving. Okay, fine. <laughs> those that were, because not all of them were. Yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, and in fact, some, I mean, here's the thing. Some were abolitionists, like Quincy the Adams. The entire three-fifths provision of the Constitution, the de jure institutionalization of slavery, protection of slavery in the new American system, those were the products of the need for compromise, right? You had 13 colonies. Sort of. Three-fifths is a lot more get, complicated than that. You had you know to get... You had to get consensus from rural states, well, small states, three small population, was not about consensus. and the South, where slavery was an institution that they were dead fast if they were going to form a country. Do you want to go into the three-fifths direction? Because they, they put it to actually make southern states weaker. Because southern states wanted ha to count every slave well, yes. as a census, so they had a disproportionate yeah. amount of votes, so they could eventually make slavery the law of the land. Right. Three-fifths was actually a way to make sl slave states weaker and keep the union together. Yeah, it was but actually... But it's, yeah, so it's compromise. It was a compromise, but it was actually an anti-slavery compromise. I mean, it is, yeah. I mean, but it, it, it's day, told as, it, as a... It's what they had, to, the deal with the devil right. they had to however, make to get us this fabulous country that we now However, have to we look at the Putin. Northwest Ordinance, Article 6 or Article 7 of the Northwest Ordinance, no new slavery in the new territories. So there's yeah. a lot, there, uh, right. most students would walk away with that. Do you have anything on your mind you wanted to make sure you talked about? The floor is yours as we close. Well, Charlie, I, again, I'm so glad to be here to talk. I'm really impressed that you've developed a show that we can come and have this kind of conversation. And um, I hope other people will come and speak with you. You can help me find guests. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, people were like, are you crazy? You're doing that. I'm like, look, uh, I think that you have hit a point in your career Congratulations, a very oh, successful career um, where you have a lot of influence on a lot of young minds. And I, if I can have an opportunity to come and also join you in that influence for you know an hour, it's it's a, a real pleasure to me. Thank and, you. And finding out that you're a Duck fan. Well, that's. I mean, that's just the that's the that's everything. Yeah, I just I, I think that these discussions are really important. I actually think we agree on more than not. I. Um, I had this belief you were going to have like this very anti-American view of history, kind of like because that's just kind of well, I deal with that a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you also get a very distorted view of the world, right? Because you're in I, politics. And I'll like take I just that. spoke to this woman on the airplane next to me because she's like, "What do you do?" I'm like, "Well, I, you know, I mean, never want to tell people what I do, yeah. right? Because politics. I'm sure you're the yeah. same, right? So I try I'm a to talk be, show host, try right. to be a little vague, but like you know, it, it never works out all the way. And uh, this woman. You know, she doesn't know any of the news that's happened over the last three months. I mean, she knows about Ukraine and Putin and maybe, um, you know, inflation or other things like that. And I think it's so important for us to remember that we are seeing the we are murdered in the extremes. Right. We are murdered in a world that is not typical modal American experience. If you know who Nancy Pelosi is, you are a weirdo. Right. Like if you go stand in a grocery store and yell, Nancy Pelosi, everyone's gonna be like, who the hell are you talking about? Right. And so I would urge you to to consider when you're looking at a leftist or a socialist or whatever to um, remember, you're probably not looking at a, yeah, I mean, a modal I just, Democrat. I, I look I just look at the theorists that are implementing things like Nicole Hannah Jones and Foucault right. 
and well, Foucault's not alive, right. but Ibrahim I mean, it's the same thing I do, right? I mean, I look at like what's happening within, you know, the conservative movement right now, its embrace of, you know, more authoritarian elements. I mean, to me, a CRT, a, 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 a bill that comes in and tells teachers, hey, this is what you can and cannot discuss in a classroom, and we're going to put a monitoring system is, is big government, So I, I, right? I, I got to go there. You yeah. think we're embracing authoritarianism? Yes, very much so. Have you heard of Justin Trudeau? Yeah, but so here's the thing. Totalitarianism and Justin Trudeau. Come on, really? Defend that. He just declared martial law, emergency Boers Act, that was but used for invasions if those, against truckers. If those protesters were Black Lives Matter protesters, though, I have no doubt you'd be like, hell yeah, yeah you know move why? them out, man. You know why? <laughs> they burned 30 churches. So, so it's, what I'm saying what, to what you is... What crimes did the truckers commit? It's really important, and I do this to the left no, all the time. No, seriously, what crimes? Like, like George W. Bush... He was a controversial president, Not a fan. okay? But he was a normal president. Followed the basic rules of law. You could argue the surveillance stuff is a little bit extraordinary. It was an extraordinary time. But generally speaking, he was an institutionalist, right? And what we're seeing within the right now is the real primacy of a movement that is not interested in small L no, 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 I, liberal I, I, I want to focus on this Trudeau thing, though. You realize they shut down bank accounts for people that supported Trump. Yes, because How that, is that money, not authoritarianism? Because in other state, other country, like our, our system is so atypical. Like I always I had to explain that to students. Okay, here's the American election system. There's basically, I mean, there's little rules here and there. Oh, after 180 days, an interest group can't mention the, the party name or whatever, right? But generally speaking, when you compare us to other Western democracies, we have almost no rules. No, you can say or do almost but, anything but how, how and for it, as long as you want. So we have really moved into a situation where we're just constantly campaigning. So, so, yeah, so yeah, Trudeau so, signs so, the War Act, seizes crypto wallets right. and bank accounts because, because a bunch of truckers were in Because in Canada, in when, you spend, when you send money from another country to influence domestic politics, that's a crime. That's not what they were going after. But yeah, okay. no, that's so, why they got the, the, the there was only thirty percent of the sourcing of that donation so, came from so Canada. You, you were, and I believe that they kept that money. I think they only divested well, that other portion they, because they, it's against the law. They confiscated Gibbs and going all that, but this idea that the right is embracing authoritarianism yeah. while in Australia they say you can't leave your home after ten PM. Yeah, but they almost killed nobody. Like we just we decided to do let it rip. And you know, whether or not no, that was the didn't. right no policy and half true. the country yes we did, Charlie. We opened Georgia, Florida and Texas. And Florida had in some of the March. best results of any right? state. Right. No, I mean the death have you seen death the rate death rate way lower for, than New York. No. Yes. No, dude, especially, especially when Especially for old people. Especially when you look past the vaccine time period where we really see red states with disproportionately high COVID mortality rates. It can't be serious. For, uh, I will it's show you that opposite. data. Since you Flo love data, Florida, I will show Florida it to you. Florida has a much better death hey, rate can, If I make you a deal, can you make me a deal, Charlie? New York versus because Florida Because the COVID professor in me cares. If I can prove to you Florida that the vaccine mattered and cut death rates big time in only, states that vaccine, guess what? Will only, you get the vaccine? Absolutely not. Only what? if you could prove... Only if you could prove one thing. If every single one of the units of measurement was also given early treatments. All right. Well, it's a Charlie, pandemic of the untreated, not let me a pandemic. Ask you this. What's your of, favorite flower? My fa I don't really think about that. Okay, well, I need to know when I have to send it to you in the ICU, buddy. You a know? rose? <laughs> hey, I, I don't have any plans to go there anytime soon. I hope not, dude. And but thankfully, it does kill I'm armed randomly, with, so please, get the vaccine. Not, never going to happen. How are we going to do duck games if you're dead? Well, guess what? I want to walk, so I'm not getting the vaccine. Yeah, but no, you so, know what? You're not going to not be able to walk. So you, just true story. I asked my whole audience of America Fest, 10,000 people, how many people know someone who died from the vaccine or was paralyzed or crippled? Every hand went up. Oh, yeah? This is bigger than you could ever imagine. It's either they're all lying or there's a scandal happening in front of you like you wouldn't believe. I know my teacher pulled my third grade classroom and they all wanted more recess time. It was a real shock. Yeah, so basically you're saying they're all liars. That's a good way to end. So, <laughs> I like all right, it. Th anything you want to plug? I do want to plug Oregon Docs again. Go okay. Docs, go land and go get us some five stars, buddy. I want a natty. Thank you for watching this episode of Debate Night. Rachel, thank you for being our guest. And next time on Debate Night, Charlie Kirk will be debating Buck Angel on transgenderism in America. We'll see you next time.